Okay, welcome to the March 28th edition of the Fats, Fuels, and Oils webinar. This week, we're going to talk about um, uh, soybean stocks and, and the potential impact on crush, and then soybean oil supplies, and then uh, soybean oil prices. On Friday, USDA is going to release their quarterly grain stocks report and their prospective plannings report. Typically, this is is one of the more volatile days in in the market uh, because it's it's the first look at, at expectations for the U.S. crop, and there have there have been a range of of expectations sort of broadly, and I think that um, the the argument about whether we get more corn acres or more soybean acres one of I think I have felt like we probably will get another increase in soybean acres and corn acres kind of probably stay about the same. Of course, there are other things that, there are things that determine the acreage mix that don't have anything to do with um, economics. First, and in, in the primary reason that farmers choose to plant one crop or the other generally, is or I guess this probably accounts for the largest percent of the percentage of their decision is crop rotation. So if you plant corn one year and then plant corn the next year and then plant corn the next year, you start to get a yield drag uh, you, because corn takes nitrogen out of the soil and then soybeans actually return nitrogen to the soil. And so typically farmers will on the same ground will plant corn one year or maybe two years, that part will depend a little bit on economics, and then plant soybeans after that, or plant soybeans one year or, or, or two years, and then plant corn after that. Um, the second most important factor is the weather during the spring. Historically, farmers have planted corn first, and then when they finished planting corn, they planted soybeans. And so if spring was wet early, then corn got backed up and the window for soybeans kind of narrowed. Although you can you can plant soybeans later than corn uh, because of the way that they the the two crops develop differently essentially. And so the soybean window is is a little later than corn. Um, however, a couple of years ago, sort of starting in in parts of Illinois and in Iowa, farmers figured out that if they plant their soybeans earlier, they actually get better yields. And that trend has increased over the last couple of years. And so it it sort of limits the the impact that early season weather has on on the acreage mix. But still, because the window for soybeans is longer, um, the uh, the early season weather will tend to have an impact. And if early season weather is, is poor, then you may not get as many soybean acres um, as, the, as Friday's report would say. Um, however, there is a point where, and this happened uh, in 2019 or 18 with that really wet year, there is a point where farmers run out of time to plant corn and then they plant more soybean acres than, um, than they announce in their intentions. This year, the weather looks, I, at this point, it, it generally looks fine. Um, there's been a pretty substantial improvement in uh, the drought area. And however, I think that one of the big factors in, in how many soybean acres we will get will be sort of winter wheat abandonment in Oklahoma and Texas and those areas. And then what does acreage look like in um, in North Dakota, South Dakota, those areas? Because they're so far north, uh, they obviously can't start planting as early as, as other areas. Um, and and so the the early season weather there is later than other areas, but if it's bad, then it's tough for them to to plant all the acres that they want. 
um, the one variable on the on the expansion of soybean acres in in sort of some traditional winter wheat areas um, is that uh, China has has imported a lot of sorghum recently, and as a result, it may be that in some of those areas, instead of planting soybeans, farmers would, will choose to plant um, sorghum. But either way, the report will be interesting and 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 should. Uh, like I said, it, it typically provides a lot of volatility for that day. The other report that they'll release on Friday is, is the quarterly stocks report. Most years, I think the quarterly stocks report is not, it, it's not unimportant, but it's, uh, if, if you're going to have a, a 600 million bushel carryout in soybeans, the quarterly stocks in any given uh, quarter are important for people that that trade spreads but in terms of market direction um, or adding a bunch of volatility and unless the number comes in way uh, far away from market expectations it usually is not uh, it, it's not a significant driver of, of volatility now that said this year the quarterly stocks report is going to be really important because of expectations for historically tight uh, a soybean carry out. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of go through and talk a little bit about that. And so, and then the implications for, uh, again, crush and, and then soybean oil production and, and soybean oil prices. Okay, so this chart just shows uh, the stocks to use uh, versus the marketing year average futures price. And you can see there's a relationship here, but it's it's not that strong. Honestly, I, I made this chart just for this presentation. The chart that I use um, to actually predict soybean prices looks at uh, U.S. and South American stocks versus usage because um, South America produces so many um, soybeans. But still, this is this gives you a sense of of where we are in, in the U.S. and sort of what it can imply for prices. So obviously, uh, with a sub 200 million bushel carryout, we are at the uh, at the upper left hand corner of the chart. Um, we're a little bit in, in terms of, of price, we're kind of about where we were last year, despite the stocks to use ratio falling a little bit. And that's really because of, of the size of the Brazilian crop, basically. Um, the Argentine crop is significantly smaller than expectations, but the Brazilian crop is bigger and, and kind of continues to get bigger. Uh, although I think we probably are, are zeroing in on, on where it is around 155 or 156 million tons. Um, but nevertheless, the ending stocks number is important, uh, or the, the quarterly stocks report will be important in determining sort of where this ending stocks number is, right? So stocks in the, at the end of the second quarter will have an impact on where we start the third quarter and, and so on and so forth. And so um, so this stocks report, even though it's, it's not the, the stocks report for the end of the marketing year, it can tell us a lot about where we expect stocks to be going forward. And the, um, the second quarter ending stocks, third quarter beginning stocks can be particularly important because of the typical seasonal pattern for um, crush and exports where we crush and, and export a lot of soybeans early on in, in the marketing year. And then those both tend to slow as we get into the uh, the summer months, and so if we look, this is generally the uh, the change from second quarter stocks to third quarter stocks, and you can see this year what we have built in is is not necessarily a a record drawdown from second quarter to third quarter, but it's certainly historically high, and it includes. 500, almost 575 million bushels of crush, 
and 290 million bushels of exports. The, um, the export number, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on this in, in a couple of slides, the export number is maybe a little bit higher than the traditional or than the historical pattern would suggest in part because of um, the, the, the drought in, in Argentina. Argentina is not a huge exporter of, of soybeans. They typically export products or typically want to export products, um, but they do export soybeans and they export soybeans to China. And so the fact that uh, they're not going to means that either Brazil needs to step up or, or the US needs to step up and, and export more soybeans uh, in, I would say, over the last month or so, because there have been delays getting the Brazilian crop to ports. And, and it's always just kind of tough to get the Brazilian crop to ports. It's, it's big and um, and parts of the country are very rural, and so um, it can take a while to get uh, just from a distance perspective, and and then um, just it, it can be difficult to get the crop out to the ports. The result of that has been, I think, a bit stronger inspections data, and, and in fact, I've had to take my forecast for uh, the March export total up I think twice in, in the past two weeks because uh, the inspections data has been a little bit stronger than, uh, than I expected. Um, but combined and then with the net of, of trade flows, we expect that um, from the second quarter, which is the, the number that we'll get this Friday to the uh, stocks on June 1st, uh, that number will decline. And the stocks on June 1st really will be a, a very important number because by the time we get through the third quarter, then we'll have a very good idea of, I think, where we expect um, the carryout to be. And that's when the market's attention, by, the, by that point, the crop is planted and it started to develop and the market really starts to focus on um, what's going on with the U.S. crop and, and, and how big is it going to be. With the carryout that we have forecast, it's going to be important for the earliest planted soybeans, which are typically sort of in the Delta uh, region, Tennessee, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, that area, to, uh, to develop well and yield well because early harvested soybeans from that area typically bridge the gap between the old crop soybeans and the new crop soybeans. And again, if you have a 600 million bushel carryout, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you're down to 185 million bushels, whether those soybeans are available or not can have a big impact, not only on what your, your crush looks like during the, the sort of August and September timeframe, um, but also whether you can export soybeans or not. A lot of those soybeans head directly to the Gulf, one, because of, of proximity, and two, because what you usually see is, and if we look at um, the, the pattern here for U.S. soybean exports, what you usually see is a little tick up uh, at the end of the marketing year as some of those early harvested soybeans come in and then as the as brazil which goes through kind of a similar pattern shifts from sort of the peak of their export season down into the middle or 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 kind of the lower end of the range of their their monthly exports this year with with again with Argentina not really probably exporting any soybeans at all or very few soybeans out of out of the current crop. Brazil having a, enough soybeans to make up for Argentina, there's some question about whether we'll get this little blip up from July to August that I'm predicting. Um, but what I think is is going to happen and what I think is going to be important and and what will be really important about the third quarter is um, how how much do we export at that point 
because if if Brazil has a lot of soybeans to export, the U.S. isn't competitive and our exports drop down to, to minimal levels, which is kind of what we're forecasting. Um, they could drop a little bit more, but we're basically right along the bottom of, of where uh, exports have historically been from May through uh, May through July. Um, if, if Brazil can fill all of the demand during that period, our exports could be even lower, and that could either a provide more supplies for um, the crush or lift the carry out a bit and um, and provide some ease for prices. And I think what we've seen over the last um, over the last couple of weeks at, at the very least, over the last several weeks, maybe, is a sharp decline in in soybean prices, and I think part of that is because the market has has kind of come to grips with the idea that while the Argentine crop has been much worse than expected, um, the Brazilian crop is is large enough to to more than make up for that, and probably enough that U.S. exports during the summer are um, will fall to minimal levels. Now. If for some reason something happens and um, and U.S. exports are are above our expectations, then that has obviously the opposite impact. It's tough to draw down ending stocks or to predict ending stocks much lower than 185 million bushels. There is a concept called pipeline um, carryout, which is essentially how what volume of soybeans is is just kind of difficult to get at based on logistics and emptying out the bin, bins and, and what farmers are willing to, uh, how much of the crop that's left farmers are willing to part with. And that's somewhere between, I used to think of that as, as sort of 100 million bushels. Now it's probably somewhere between 150 and, and 200 million bushels just based on um, the increase that we've seen in production. So if, if exports are, are larger than expected, it's not like we can really take um, ending stocks down that much. And so that leaves us with reducing our crush forecast. Right now, uh, our crush forecast is, is about in line with where USDA was in their, in their March WASDE report. I think we're 5 million bushels above where they were. But Crush keeps coming in sort of lower than market expectations. I think the NOPA report this month was only slightly lower than market expectations. But at the beginning of the year, I think that a lot, I think I certainly thought that given the demand for biofuel feedstocks that um, oil would be driving the crush by now and um, and we would be crushing just basically at capacity or very close to capacity uh, almost month after month because the demand for um, feedstocks would be so great. The the problems that that some renewable diesel producers have had with um, getting pretreatment up and, and going and, and sort of the overhang of supply that that has resulted in, I think that has had an impact on crush. However, given that oil share is, is now below 40%, meal is, is firmly driving um, monthly crushing volumes. The crushers are able to provide enough soybean oil to the market uh, to keep prices from, you know, skyrocketing and not that that's necessarily their goal, but if they crush to meet the, the meal demand, then they get enough soybean oil that what we've seen is that the market has been, um, the, the soybean oil price has been happy to, to move lower. And again, part of that is, is this sort of short-term supply overhang, concerns about uh, an economic slowdown or a banking crisis, a big drop in, in energy prices, kind of all of those things have come together to, to lower soybean oil prices recently. Um, the question is what's gonna happen in, in the second half of the year? And, and I've talked about my theory to death. Um, 
but there's also a question of if that really is true will we have enough soybeans to crush if we switch into this mode where we're crushing soybeans for oil as opposed to uh to meet meal demand but right now meal demand is firmly in place they're firmly driving it i put this chart in just for two reasons one i wanted to talk about how much crush margins have have come down from the levels that they were at but two i just thought it was it was kind of interesting it's obviously not a, a long-term chart and it's probably almost as much coincidental as it is anything else but if you look at um at the at heating oil futures against the board crush uh in march you can see that um board crush and, and heating oil futures kind of march lower in in lockstep or or nearly in in lockstep with each other um if you look at where crush was over the past six months the average was nearly two dollars and fifty cents the long-term average crush margin on the board is somewhere below slightly below a dollar somewhere between probably 80 cents and and dollar somewhere in there so two dollars and fifty cents is are amazing margins for crushers and you would think they would just crush as much as they can but like i said it crush has been it hasn't been um it hasn't been so low that uh that the the 2.225 billion bushel forecast looks outrageous or is a, at a level that is unattainable so they have been crushing a lot but just not quite as much as um as i expected and as i think you might anybody might think if um if you all that you knew was what the crush margin was um i think you would assume that that crushers would be crushing at capacity to uh to maximize the that value of course if they all do it then it's a uh then there's too much supply and crush margins come down but that's a different day's discussion um for the next six months our forward forecast for crush is about dollar 60 per bushel that still is again if if the long-term average is is 80 to 80 cents to a dollar that's still nearly double um the long-term average so I don't think that there is a um I don't think that there's a concern about sort of exports being really really competitive with crush and exports kind of taking precedent over crush because the, economically it, it makes a lot more sense to do to to export soybeans than um than to crush them not that exports can't be more profitable economically but even if they are it's again it's not like uh crushers are going to be not still crushing at at historically high um crush margins so anyway all right so if meal is is really driving uh the crush then um what have we been doing in meal consumption and i think one of the more surprising things this year in in a little bit last year too last year the surprising thing was that meal consumption and if you just look at average daily use for last year was basically nearly a record almost every every month there's a couple of months in there that aren't but there are there are plenty of records that were are there are plenty of months where uh where domestic meal consumption was was much higher than it has been historically and that has that has really slowed uh over the over the past couple of months um you can see from from october where we were at at an all-time record to january where we're the lowest in the past sort of three years um there's a big difference in in meal consumption we have meal consumption sort of rebounding through the rest of of the year but um I, 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 this is a, a forecast that I have sort of cut down and cut down. It's partially, it, it's, it's mostly model driven. So there's a model that looks at, um, at 
the livestock slaughter and then kind of backs into meal demand based on livestock livestock slaughter. Um, but there are times that I will adjust it. So this is probably maybe a little bit higher than if I just did this kind of by hand and, and by trend and said, okay, well, given what we've seen over the past four months, then February, March, April, all of those should be significantly lower. Um, but given what we expect for um, for poultry and in in hog slaughter, particularly, um, that's what it implies for for meal demand going forward. Not the record levels that we've seen, um, but uh, but probably not as low as we've as we've seen recently either. And at least in the short term, and and maybe for the rest of the marketing year. That likely means that um, that if crush has fallen below market expectations um, recently, or come in below market expectations recently, if you get a recovery in in domestic demand, then um, then maybe it starts to come in above uh, expectations, or or at the very least match expectations. But I think this number is is one of the key numbers to to pay attention to. Um, I know that people this webinar are primarily interested in, in biofuel feedstocks, but this is going to drive the, the supply or the domestic supply of, of soybean oil. So knowing what's going on in meal is, is important. It's tough, to, it's tough to take soybean oil out or, or any vegetable oil out uh of the context of the complex and and try to predict what's going on in the market just by looking at what's going on in, in the in that oil market you need to understand um what else is is going on because it's important and that varies from market to market in canola um canola oil obviously is a bigger part of the of the crush value and so it has a um, it has a it has more of an impact on on crushing volumes than soybean meal or than soybean meal does on soybeans, but for soybeans, soybean meal really does drive um, crushing volumes, and domestic demand drives uh, drives that. All right, now the other um, source for meal demand obviously is is exports, and um, this is something that. This year, I think, is not is not going to be as impactful as as it will be in in the coming years. So, this year, even if 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 the theory that we need a lot more biofuel feedstock and crush moves higher in the in the second half of of the marketing year. And then we produce a lot more meal than um, and than we need domestically. So meal demand doesn't recover. We end up needing to produce a lot more soybean meal um, to meet the domestic soybean oil demand. Um, then what happens is the soybean meal prices either need to fall to a level where they will price themselves into the feed where ration where they can start to substitute for some other things, or they need to be exported. Be, again, because of what's gone on in Argentina, the export market this year probably is happy to accept whatever volume the U.S. wants to um, wants to ship out. And um, but going forward, if we assume a, a recovery in Argentine production next winter, and then by next winter we really are crushing for oil, one of the side effects of that is going to be that protein meal prices are probably going to come down pretty dramatically because the U.S. is going to need to export a lot or or feed a lot more meal domestically um, than it has traditionally. And, um, and because the sort of the marginal ton of, of meal will tend to price it all. Um, what that means is that um, that Argentine meal is probably going to need to be pretty competitive to compete with uh, US soybean meal exports. And 
that probably is going to have an impact on on Argentine crush margins and and also ultimately U.S. crush margins. Um, so this chart kind of it, it doesn't give you a lot of detail about sort of what's going on in the next quarter or two. Um, what I would say is is that our our export number is significantly higher than um, than USDA's, although our um, our domestic use numbers are are not dramatically different, and that's in part because we have different uh, different assumptions about the um, the meal yield. Um, but really, in the in the short term and for the purposes of this discussion, I think it's really going to be that domestic demand that drives. Um, crush in the short term, and then in the longer term, in the second half of the year, if everything sort of lines up, um, then we will probably need to push the meal out into the export market. Crush margin could come back down a little bit lower if, if meal prices fall, and um, and then we could get back into a situation where, depending on what happens with the oil price um, crush margins fall we might end up crushing just enough to to make to meet the demands of the oil market um, but we have a, a lot of extra meal that needs to find a home in the export market and that's kind of what we assume going forward for sure um all right so it, really the bottom line on soybeans and um, the impact that they're going to have on on soybean oil prices is that the U.S. stocks look like they're going to be very tight. And so this Friday's report for uh, quarterly stocks, that number will be key because from that number, you can kind of derive what you think uh, stocks will be the next quarter and, and then the, what the carryout will be. But you also can derive what you think will be available for crush during the um, during the second half of of the marketing year and the second half of the, of the calendar year. Now, the last part of the last quarter of the calendar year will have new crop beans to crush, so it's a little less important for for that. But really, during the the second half of of the marketing year, um, if if that number comes in lower than than market expectations. Um, then I think you probably uh, will see a rally in in soybean meal and um, and probably a rally in in soybean prices uh, because I think that the the speculators will probably continue to express express bullishness about the soybean complex through at least in part. Um, long oil or short oil share position. So long soybean meal and short soybean oil. And so sort of counterintuitively, I think that uh, if there are concerns about how much, how, how many soybeans are left to crush for the rest of the year, um, I think that while it probably lifts all, all three boats in, in the complex, um, relative to the other two soybean oil probably will be a little bit the, the gains will probably be a little bit smaller until the uh until the, the biofuel industry um feedstock demand is really kind of where people thought it would be uh, three months ago or or six months ago the only other thing i would say about it before we talk a little bit about tallow is that if you look outside of, of the U.S. And, and look outside of the, the soybean oil market, you have a couple of things that are going on that are a little bit at, at odds with each other. So this week in palm oil, I wrote about how um, the palm oil prices have fallen dramatically since the beginning of the month. But it looks like they might have put in, at the very least, a, a short-term bottom and, and maybe a long-term bottom. And that's because, in part, if you look at what the um, what the the inner month surveys are saying about production, they're suggesting production that is a little bit lower uh, on an average daily basis than it was in in February, and 
based on sort of the tradition or the the historical trend in in palm oil production um if if march output is going to be where the survey suggests it's going to be it's difficult to go from march output at, at one level and then the next month take it up to where you were before if, if that level is significantly below where you were expecting and so as a result i i cut my forecast for um for palm oil in that took my ultimately the change there took ending stocks back to the the two million ton sort of line of demarcation um and in indonesia uh the indonesian palm oil association just released their monthly data and their stocks number was tighter than expected and the tightest in in quite a while uh and so if it, it, it looks like palm oil could be a little bit more bullish. Now, on the other side of the coin is canola, where after the drought, we got a good crop and uh, canola crushers are finding demand for uh, canola meal in, in export markets, and they're finding demand for canola oil in export markets really a lot in, in the US where canola oil demand has been really strong in part because in one of the things I talked about this week is because canola oil prices are very competitive with with soybean oil and probably at this point in many markets canola oil is trading at a discount to um to soybean oil just based on our we have to do that weird um comparison where we're comparing sort of central Illinois uh, RBD soybean oil with Los Angeles RBD canola oil that spread has fallen to like a, a penny, which if you just look at the logistical difference, suggests that um, that canola oil is probably trading at a discount to uh, soybean oil. There will be variations in each market. Each market has its own uh, supply and demand that will that will tweak that a little bit. But in general, canola oil is very, very competitive. And so because of that, uh, canola oil demand has, has been really, really strong. But the supply has also been there. The the weekly change in in Canadian crushing volumes over the past month is basically double what the uh, five year average has been. So they have enough so uh, enough canola seed to crush, and they are doing it, and the demand is there. Um, so canola oil is is helping supply the world vegetable oil market which I think, like we talked about before, has sort of swung from short the last two years to at least in balance or, or maybe even a little oversupplied this year. But it looks like some of the trends that I would say were, were driving kind of the oversupply may be starting to, to reverse, and, and palm oil is, is the primary one there. Canola oil is going to stay sort of the same for... In, until we get into the next crop, um, but uh, palm oil is one where I had expected a, a significantly a, a significant increase in production year over year, and now I've taken it back down to basically kind of kind of unchanged year over year. Okay, on to uh, fats increases and tallow. So tallow prices. Uh, this past week dropped down to uh, they dropped to three and a half cents to fifty one and a half cents uh, basis the Packer market in in Chicago, and that's that's below sort of there's a a December twenty twenty one low that kind of had been the the long term low that the market sort of needed to take out uh, if it's going to continue to move lower. It took that out just barely, though, um, and so it's it's the lowest price since uh, like March 2020 or or something like that. Um, and part of the reason why is that even though uh, we've talked about the turn in the cattle cycle and the impact that that's going to have on on production of of tallow, and well, it's going to have on slaughter and then the the production of tallow. Um, but what I what I found when I looked a little bit deeper into this, and not that I 
don't pay attention to this stuff, but I don't always get to look at things like tallow yield. And what has happened this year is the tallow yield has, has risen pretty substantially from where it was last year. And so that is expected, at least in uh, over the balance of this year, to basically offset the um, the decrease in in slaughter. Uh, now the uh, the slaughter number for January was a little bit above where I think we expected it to be, and a little bit higher than December. So January production um, of tallow was was relatively high. You can see compared to to last year or, or the five year average, but as the impact of the turn in the cattle cycle starts to really impact slaughter and, and we have slaughter going forward on a monthly basis, I think the average decline uh, it, per month is is 4% relative to uh, last year's level. And because of that, even with the uh, the increase in in yield, we expect that um, that production probably is going to continue to fall relative to the um, relative to last year and relative to the to the five year average. Now, on the other side of that is is imports, which we've talked about before, and uh, we've got imports up and and production up, and so even even if um, even if even as production slows sort of during the summer, it's possible that that imports will offset that. Now we've got imports slowing during the summer, uh, primarily because of, of this recent decline in prices. Um, but I think that's a that's something that can be turned back on somewhat quickly. Uh, and especially if if biofuel feedstock demand really rises raises the price of, of feedstocks and tallow prices get back to 60 cents or above 60 cents, um, then I think that you would see uh, imports probably at or above the level that we're expecting. For, for imports, we kind of have, we had a really strong start to the marketing year, and then we have them slowing to in the summer, I think below where last year's volumes were, and then sort of picking back up in towards the end of, of the year. And if if we get a big rally in prices, it may be that that summer sort of low is is not quite where it was, um, especially if if production declines a little bit relative to, um, to our expectations. All of that should, um, while, while there will be enough supply um, and, and, and the supply should, feel, I, I suppose, relatively um, secure because we've already sort of assumed big declines in, in slaughter and, um, and we, we've slowed imports at least for, uh, for a period during the summer. So it's, it's hard to kind of, not that we couldn't potentially do it, but it's hard to kind of move your, your expectations for supply lower from, from where we are, at least during the summer months. Um, so that that part feels relatively secure um, and in theory should contribute if it just if everything else were unchanged should help support tallow prices going forward um, but you also have the demand side and um, for demand we've got demand growing pretty substantially uh, as well now tallow is one of the most commonly used biofuel feedstocks. And so we have tallow uh, feedstock demand going up 11% this year. And I don't think that's a big surprise. I think we can, you know, we can sort of talk about where tallow, you know, the the last 50 million pounds of, of feedstock demand or the last 100 million pounds of, of feedstock demand. But I think as renewable diesel capacity increases and as biofuel production increases, um, tallow, uh, tallow consumption by the biofuel industry is going to increase until it starts to reduce non-biofuel demand to a level that um, 
that gets down to sort of where it's it's minimal level and tallow actually has really strong non-biofuel demand as well so we've got right now we've got uh, non-biofuel demand up almost five percent year over year to a record 2.9 billion pounds uh, and through the first three months of the year which is what we have data for um the non-biofuel demand has has increased pretty substantially from the same period last year so we've got at, at least a quarter's worth of support for that record forecast which i think would have seemed odd and and i think was odd i think i whenever I've done the forecast for, for non-biofuel in, in tallow, I've always kind of assumed that um, that we were going to shrink from uh, probably the 2.2 billion pound uh, level and initially in 2018 or 2019, um, but that demand has been much more robust than, uh, than anticipated. The one thing that can certainly have an impact and a significant impact on on Talos non-biofuel demand is is the economy. And I I would say, and I think I said this last week or the week before, broadly speaking, fats and greases and vegetable oils are in everything. And so um, the the their prices and movement in their prices and movement in their consumption can be a a good leading economic indicator because the stuff is is just literally in everything. And uh, so if the economy slows, if what has been happening in, in the banking industry turns into something that is, is much bigger, much more problematic, or the interest rate increases that the Fed has undertaken over the past year or so, um, really start to have an impact on economic activity then uh, that could reduce non-biofuel use and and biofuel use uh, for tallow uh, and depending on how much the economy slowed or, or didn't slow um, it could have a, a relatively significant impact on on non-biofuel use that said Given the strength of non-biofuel use that we've seen so far, so far, and the strength of, of biofuel use, really, I think that um, you probably tallow would be sort of not the last to be impacted, but maybe one of the one of the commodities that's impacted less than um, than other commodities. All right, with that um what we can do what time is it what we can do is we can run through our usual bio uh fuel margin um stuff i guess for lack of a better way to put it um come on bear with me here one second all right Okay, so uh, this week, what I what I kind of wrote about for um, for biofuel is is kind of the the forward look for for profitability of, of biofuel for both um, biodiesel and, and renewable diesel. Um, I've talked before a little bit about the the premium that biodiesel is traded at relative to renewable diesel. Uh, and how that's been unusual. And, and the last time I showed the chart of, of our forecast for that spread kind of going forward, I kind of had it sort of slowly tailing off so that renewable diesel ultimately traded at a premium, I think by the end of the year. Of course, that all just went right out the window and renewable diesel started trading at a premium to biodiesel yesterday. And so I revised that forecast and that has an impact on um, on our expectations for gross margins. Uh, if you look at, at now our, our expectations for gross margins, um, we still have biodiesel coming down. We don't have it quite going down as much or, or as sharply as, as we did a couple of weeks ago. 
I'm really pretty comfortable with with this forecast, certainly much more comfortable with this forecast than I was with the one that showed it just falling off a cliff and, and going negative in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the uh, the reversal in in that spread is is part of the reason for the relative change in the outlook for profitability. Now we have uh, obviously biodiesel kind of slowly declining through the end of the year, which which makes sort of intuitive sense to me. Um, and then a little pop at the beginning of, of next year, and then it starts to go back down. Next year is primarily a, a feedstock thing. This year, it's it's in the short term, it's a little bit of, of falling energy prices. Um, but then in the after a month or two, it's it's probably more about rising feedstock costs um, than it is about uh, energy prices. For renewable diesel, we have margins kind of sticking around where they are right now, pretty much through the uh, through the end of the year, as sort of the the short term weakness in energy is offset by um, weakness in in feedstock prices, and then as energy prices start to rise, and we have them starting to rise, kind of in May, June timeframe, you also get an increase in um, an increase in feedstock prices and that keeps margins relatively um, relatively stable for renewable diesel. And again, sort of the other way to think about this is is renewable diesel sort of represents uh, biofuels made from fats and greases because of our, our feedstock mix, which is 50% uh, tallow, 25% DCO, and 25% and UCO. And biodiesel represents soybean oil, using soybean oil to make biomass-based diesel because um, our feedstock mix there is 75% soybean oil and 25% yellow grease. Uh, the RIN forecast was kind of interesting this week. So, if you look at the um, at the hobo spread as a predictor for RIN prices, um, it's a it, it's a pretty good predictor. Again, probably not as well correlated as the as just feedstock costs by themselves. Um, but if you look at the um, the hobo spread, and then you look at sort of the implied profitability of, of ethanol production by taking uh, the price of corn and, and gasoline. What happens is that uh, the hobo spread kind of rises through the year, actually, I can show it this, can I? So we have it forecast to rise a little bit and then kind of stabilize. If you look at the what the futures forward curve is doing, um, and this is where we are today, the blue line, um, it's got it sort of rising out and then and then tailing off. And so in theory, what that should mean for RIN prices is you get RIN prices that um, rise and then start to fall as we go into uh, the end of the year, just based on the idea that, okay, the, the hobo spread at, at least represents profitability. And, and part of that is, is feedstock costs. Again, feedstock costs probably drive RIN prices more than profitability, but in theory, RIN price, RINs are, are an insurance policy on, on margins. Um, but what happens is that as the, as the hobo spread starts to decline, then the profitability of, of ethanol production starts to decline. Um, so that implies higher D6 prices, which then help support RIN prices through the end of the year. I'm not sure that I really have tons and tons of confidence that uh, we get back up here to 195 in, in December or that D6 gets all the way up to 180. Um, the model actually wanted to take it a little bit higher this week and I, I backed off the D6 and the, and the D4 a little bit from where the model wanted to put it. Um, 
it also the other thing that I would say is what we've seen over the last couple of, of days to weeks or to a week is is that the spread between the D6 and the D4 has started to widen and it's it was about 10 uh, 10 cents um, the uh, on yesterday I think so it's it's been really narrow the market's been really concerned about the ethanol blend wall and I think that maybe what's going on is that um, the market is starting to come to grips with the idea that um, that uh, if there's an economic slowdown, ethanol production probably will um, because the the RBOs will will decline or the the mandates that were published, the annual mandates that were published will decline with with declining gasoline usage. And then that brings production closer to, uh, closer to demand, maybe that's what's going on. Uh, I that's that's sort of my best guess. I it, it surprised me a little bit to see that the um, that the spread had had widened that much when I looked at it last night. And so I'll do some digging on that, and and we'll talk about that in, in a future meeting. All right, and then LCFS, I. I made some changes to the LCFS forecast, and and it's I had the LCFS forecast I think going up a little bit more aggressively uh, through the end of this year. I'm sort of torn halfway between just leaving the LCFS forecast flat going forward, and and what I've done, which is basically raise it by sort of two dollars and fifty cents a, a quarter, basically going forward. Um, I think that uh, that you probably will. I, I think there may be a better chance that it sort of stays flat around where it's been, sort of sixty-five ish, somewhere in there. Um, then it goes up a little bit. Um, but I think also that if if feedstock demand isn't as great as we all thought, then production is probably not as as strong either kind of going forward a little bit. Um, and ultimately that might mean that uh, that LCFS credit prices rise a little bit. We'll see what happens and, and see how long I, I can do this. But what I would say is that at least from a trend perspective, what I've done is I've made the forward curve flatter. And I think that is the, the right direction to go. Um, it may get get flatter still as we go forward. All right. Um, with that, if anybody has any questions, if not, uh, we will be done. And I will see you all next week. I hope everybody has a, a great week. And as always, thanks so much for attending. All right. Have a good week. See everybody later. Bye-bye.